I think it's important to figure out what you're good at and lean into it. Mm -hmm. Because one of the Mercer Effect things is, of course, it's the big homebrew that shows all of the, you know, all of the work that he puts into it. But it's also very atmospheric. They lean yeah. into the voices. They lean into the drama and the atmosphere of it. And for me as a GM, that is not one of my strengths. Uh, I can do some voices, but they are not on the level of <laughs> a room full of professional voice actors. Um, and especially if you game with me long enough, you're like, hey, he only has three voices, and he just <laughs> he just changes, he just like changes the volume. Um, but what I am very good at is story, and so if I can get you to play a couple of sessions with me, eventually you'll get hooked on that story. And even though the atmosphere and the, the, the incredible acting and stuff that Mercer puts into it is not present because it's just not a skill set that I have, I do know that the story and the connections are there. And which is not to say that he doesn't do that, but you know, there are specialties that the really good GMs have. And if you can figure out what yours is, and then lean into that and make that a feature of it. And say, not necessarily out loud, but through your actions, in this campaign, you're not necessarily gonna get this or this, but you are gonna get this. And this is going to be rewarding and you're gonna keep coming back for that. That can help people forget about that Mercer effect because they're not getting what they maybe thought they were going to get when they watched Critical Role and then asked you to GM for them, mm -hmm. but they are going to get something else, and it is going to be awesome. Welcome back to How to Be a Better DM, the show designed to help you, the Dungeon Master, shorten the learning curve and do it all with less time, less hassle, less money, and more fun. I'm one of your hosts today, Justin Lewis, joined with Tanner Wayland. Hey, it's me. And today we are joined with, uh, we are joined by a special guest, uh, Dan Wells. Hi, I'm Dan. And uh, for the listener who is probably uninitiated, if you don't know who Dan Wells is, uh, he is, among other things, one of the co-hosts of the Writing Excuses podcast, which I've mentioned numerous times on this show. But also, he is actually a best-selling author of such novels as Zero Chronicles and the I Am Not a Serial Killer series which actually has been adapted into an award-winning movie starring such actors as Christopher Lloyd, if you've heard of him, uh, which is super amazing. <laughs> I looked that up and I was like, that's so crazy because he's, he's, he's such a great actor. Yeah, he is. Um, but also, you are a uh, professional dungeon master with Dungeon Master Direct. Correct. Um, and actually, if you want to, you can talk about the haunt that is coming up. Yes, so in just a few weeks from the time that this airs, uh, we do a lot of uh, gaming retreats uh, called Game Night Getaway, and I partner with uh, Dungeon Master Direct on a bunch of them, including The Haunt, which is October 17 through 20 uh, in downtown Salt Lake City at the Peary Hotel. And the Peary Hotel is haunted as crap. If, <laughs> As far as I'm aware, it was here already when the pioneers arrived in the valley, and they're like, why is there a haunted hotel? Uh, so we are doing a uh, four-day gaming retreat there where it's just all gaming all the time, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah, and if you want information about that, you can go to DungeonMasterDirect.com, and a pop-up should come up, and you'll get all the information there. Yeah, we're also doing a gaming cruise next year in uh, the spring. So save up your money and, and come game with us on a ship in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> that sounds so awesome. I mean, where else would you want a game? Uh, be honest. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And so, honestly, we're just so happy to have you here, Dan, because, I mean, listeners, for years I've heard this man's voice, and I've just been like, hey, it seems like a cool guy. It mm -hmm. seems like, like he knows his stuff. And it was only in the last few years I learned you were so into, you know, D&D &D and being a DM. Mm -hmm. like, like, how did that start for you? How did it start? It started yeah. when I was a kid um, in junior high, way back in the 80s, and found the Ninja Turtles, Teenage Ninja Turtle role-playing game. What? Um, everyone in, of my 
age, uh, this kind of end of Gen X, either got into role playing through D and D or through Ninja Turtles. For me, it was Ninja Turtles, Incredible. and uh, have been a gamer ever since, and it's awesome. I started pro DMing uh, actually when the pandemic hit and everything shut down in 2020. Uh, I had it's something I had wanted to try for a long time, and then um, when suddenly no one could go to work or like leave their house or do anything, I thought, now is the time. There's a bunch of <laughs> lonely nerds with money out there, and I want to be a part of their lives. And so I started uh, just kind of on social media, put out feelers and said, hey, I'm going to start running games. Who wants to join a game? And eventually was running up to nine games. Uh, concurrent campaigns Jeez. all at the same time uh just that first year uh from march to december made like twenty three thousand dollars just playing D D with people it was awesome incredible so i mean if we've learned anything listeners pandemics give you a natural <laughs> captive audience yeah <laughs> no but yeah next time a pandemic rolls around throw your hat into the ring <laughs> and so like with that though that's a lot of campaigns to keep straight mm -hmm. and so i'm very curious because uh, i know that most dms don't have to juggle that much but some of them do have like four five campaigns going on mm -hmm. how, how did you keep it straight like how did you find time to like devote enough time to each of them uh well i this is going to sound so dumb and simple but i had a separate notepad for each one just like a, a legal size uh, notepad and I would write everything down as we were playing which is kind of my GMing style anyway yeah. uh, that if, if they mention somebody or if I want to record oh this will be a good thing to bring up later I'll write it down um, or names of NPCs that I have to make up on the fly and I'll keep track of those and so having all of those in one notebook and then uh, having a separate notebook for every campaign really made it easy when necessary to flip back through there and a lot of it is just disposable information like tracking combat initiatives and things yeah. like that but uh, I was actually going through because I was cleaning my office just over the weekend and found uh, one of my old notebooks from a Pendragon campaign that I was running uh, and it was delightful there was probably 40 pages in there of the you know small <laughs> tightly spaced notes of all the things that they were doing and all of the alliances they had forged with other counties and kingdoms and all of these things going on uh, and it's it's fun to have just as a you know memorabilia like that but also it's what helped me keep all the different campaigns straight and remember uh, I got in the habit of you know at the end of a session I would write down where they were and who they were talking to. So with fairly minimal prep, when the next session rolls around, I could pull out, this is their notebook, and I had them all like color-coded with different clips on them so yeah. that they were really easy to spot. And I'd pull it out and say, oh, okay, they're doing this, and they're in this place. I, I know what's going on. And uh, made it really easy. I love that. I, I gotta say, note-taking for me is a huge weakness. I uh, I have terrible handwriting, so that probably kind of tells you everything you need to know there. <laughs> so I'm really curious. Obviously, having notebooks, that's super genius, right? The simplest ideas are usually the smartest ones. And that's, I think, one step. Probably step two is how you take notes, right? And, and how you make what you're writing down useful for the next session. So how do you do that? Well, because of the nature of the of the notebook that I was using. Uh, I wasn't spiral bound. I was using one of those flip pages where they're all kind of uh, perforated and, and attached at the top. And so it made it not super easy to go back through them. Obviously you can, but every three or four pages I would make a new list. I would say, oh, it's time for me to re-up my notes. Like with a Pendragon one, for example, it would be okay, let me write down along one side of this who are all the major players because there's a lot of politics involved in a, in a Pendragon campaign. Um, I was doing a Curse of Strahd and so there wasn't as much of that, but I did, you know, every three or four pages I would 
remind myself on this just in the margin um, you know which people have they met have they gone to the creepy witch in the windmill yet mm -hmm. have they you know making sure that I have written down the names of the NPCs and some quick note about this person hates them this person uh, is still a secret and you know they haven't discovered this person yet um, honestly I don't write down if they haven't discovered them yet but if there's you know they've met someone and there's still a big secret they don't know I will write that uh, so that at a glance there in the side margin I can I can get kind of a sense of this is the general terrain social terrain that they're dealing with right now interesting so I guess in in summary you're essentially marking down the social character or plot landmarks you could say that they've seen and might remember yeah um, and depending on what the game is um, first of all I should say as a professional game master running nine different campaigns almost all of those were using pre-published campaign material mm -hmm. because that made it a lot easier yeah the great Pendragon campaign and Tomb of Annihilation and Curse of Strahd mm -hmm. and so on and so on there were very few that I was in fact can I think of any where I was just making it up completely I ran a 7th C campaign for a while where I was just kind of doing, making that one up, and it was so hard. <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't have time to come up with seven different stories. I'm going to use published stories. And so because of that, um, being able to mark down, okay, they're in the year 813 in Pendragon, or... Um, with one of the D&D &D ones to say which chapter they're in or which town they're currently in. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I, for most of them, was using Foundry or Roll20 or something like that uh, for some digital tools like maps and things. Mm -hmm. And then that's wonderful because it just saves it for you. Yeah. So I open my notebook and I say, oh, Curse of Strahd, they're still in this town. Um, and then I would open Roll20 and say, oh, okay, all the tokens are laid out with who they are talking to and where they are in the town um, and it just making sure to keep track of that helps a lot yeah but I feel like that's very obvious can I give better information than that <laughs> so I don't think that's so obvious right because um, I, well actually Tanner did you want to say something before I no no in? go ahead well because of the quote-unquote Mercer effect, right? Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. People see these amazing campaigns that are new, at least to them, and so I think there's a lot of pressure for dungeon masters to homebrew everything, right? To create everything. Yeah. Uh, and even I myself, with some groups that I've, you know, kind of contacted and, um, you know, I'm going to start running some, some stuff for them, I was asking them, do you guys want homebrew or pre-written and I felt a little bit of shame even offering the pre-written <laughs> idea so I you know you're absolutely right I think it's obvious except it's not in my opinion yeah no I think you've got a good point there uh, there are some campaigns such as Great Pendragon campaign uh, such as the enemy within uh, for Warhammer Fantasy that I think are incredible and I've run them several times each and uh you know that, that it's a story that I can go back to over and over again. Uh, Curse of Strahd is, is yeah. up there as well. Um, and I don't think that there's any shame in running something pre-done like that. I am fortunate in all of my work, possibly because I already have some bare level of celebrity anyway, that I never really ran into the Mercer effect. I know it's a real thing. It hurts a lot of GMs. <laughs> um, I am fortunate in that I never really had to deal with those preconceptions. Mm -hmm. But I think another one of the reasons that I never had trouble with it is I think it's important to figure out what you're good at and lean into it. Mm -hmm. Because one of the Mercer Effect things is, of course, it's the big homebrew that shows all of the, you know, all of the work that he puts into it but it's also very atmospheric they lean yeah. into the voices they lean into the drama and the atmosphere of it 
And for me as a GM, that is not one of my strengths. Uh, I can do some voices, but they are not on the level of <laughs> a room full of professional voice actors. Um, and especially if you game with me long enough, you're like, hey, he only has three voices, and he just <laughs> he just changes, he just like changes the volume. Um, but what I am very good at is story, and so if I can get you to play a couple of sessions with me, eventually you'll get hooked on that story. And even though the atmosphere and the the, the incredible acting and stuff that Mercer puts into it is not present because it's just not a skill set that I have. I do know that the story and the connections are there. And which is not to say that he doesn't do that, but you know, there are specialties that the really good GMs have. And if you can figure out what yours is and then lean into that and make that a feature of it and say not necessarily out loud but through your actions in this campaign, you're not necessarily going to get this or this, but you are going to get this. And this is going to be rewarding, and you're going to keep coming back for that. That can help people forget about that Mercer effect, because they're not getting what they maybe thought they were going to get when they watched Critical Role and then asked you to GM for them. Mm -hmm. But they are going to get something else, and it is going to be awesome. And... So don't feel like you have to be him. Just be yourself in a really impressive way. <laughs> yeah, that's it. How does that sound? Yeah, that, I love it because, and in many ways, I feel like if you don't know what your specialties are, you probably have some sense of it. But if you don't know, doing a pre-written is actually probably a better idea because the like story writing and, and world building, that's a separate set of skills, right? Mm -hmm. That Absolutely. you may or may not have. Uh, but if you do a pre-written, then you can automatically find out. It's like, okay, is role-playing a strength of mine? How about combats? How about, you know, just these different hmm. aspects? And, and basically, you're just trimming down the things that you can focus on. Because mm -hmm. someone else already wrote a great story. <laughs> yeah. And so, and in many ways, I like how you said that you replay certain campaigns multiple times. Because if you're, you know, if you're a GM who has played with multiple groups of friends and trying to get multiple of them into it, it's actually a great experiment. Like running the same first session for multiple groups, it gets you, it gives you a chance to hone it, to do it better, and then also learn more about yourself and improve in a way that if you're constantly doing something different, you can't kind of have like a control group versus, you know, <laughs> improved group, right? Yeah. I, uh, at the game night getaways that I run, uh, which at this point we're doing two or three a year. It's going to be three this year. Wow. Um, I, I have a, a Rifts campaign that I like to run. I got into gaming back with Ninja Turtles. Rifts was the same company, Palladium Books. Nice. Uh, and so it's still one of my favorites. I use the Savage Rifts, Savage Worlds uh, rules for it now. Um, but it's like a little five-day thing that I run over the course of one of these retreats and I've run it twice now and it's been completely different both times and I know that when I run it again next year on the cruise it is going to be completely different again uh, even though it is the same material uh, and the same pre-gens <laughs> that I am handing out so that we don't have to waste the time building characters um, and yeah every group brings something different to it and if you are really allowing your players to collaborate with you on telling the story that they're coming up with a lot of the stuff, mm -hmm. then even a pre-printed campaign is going to be incredibly personalized to that group of players. Yeah. So you said you allow the players to help you tell the story. And that's a, a very interesting sentence to hear personally from an author, right? So I have to ask, <laughs> well, well, because obviously mm -hmm. the, the most obvious yeah. difference between being a game master and an author is the enemy gets a vote, right? Yeah. The, well, the enemy, you know what I mean. There's, there's a bunch of players <laughs> exactly. in there trying to ruin my outline. Yeah, so, so how do you, um, how do I say this? How do you balance maybe the writer within you and the game master so that way they both are impressive, as, as you said? Um, I, it's... It's a good question, and I think it is 
easier than it sounds like it is. Um, nobody wants to, well, I shouldn't say nobody wants to railroad their players. There's definitely some <laughs> GMs that absolutely want to railroad their players. Um, but, you know, when I come up with a campaign, with a story that I want to tell, whether it is pre-published, like Great Pendragon Campaign, or something I've made up, like the Rifts one, um, I know the basic beats of it. I know who, you know, what big set pieces I want to make sure to include if there's a big fight or if there's a really interesting uh, conversation. But more so than that, I know about the moral or narrative conundrums that I want to pose. And that is what I'm thinking of. That's one of the reasons that I like Curse of Strahd as a campaign, because it does present players uh, with some interesting choices here and there. It's not fight this fight and then talk to somebody and then fight this fight and then talk to somebody. There's um, not just choice as to what order they can do all the encounters in, but there's also choices overall of, you know, who are we going to support and uh, what kind of heroes are we going to be and all of that sort of thing. Um, and if you have, if you allow those things to be questions rather than answers, if your outline is full of questions that you can ask the players through play and present them and say, here's these two kingdoms, you know, they both are viable options. Which, which one do you want to talk to? Here's the Thieves' Guild and here's the City Watch. Either one can help you find the monster that you're looking for, but they're going to be very different experiences depending on which one you do. Um, we had we did an episode of writing excuses several years ago where we talked to some people who write for video games and one thing that they pointed out to us is that in video game writing it is often you the the stations along the road are the same and there's just many different roads you can take that will lead there and that sounds very railroady i know um <laughs> the idea that no matter what the players do, they're eventually gonna end up at this one position. But that's how that, that's how it works. That's how you can do this without ramming players through it. I like to come up with outlines for uh, my books in which I am the one who is deciding <laughs> what the answers to all of those questions are, right? Yeah. Um, but in an outline for a campaign, I get to borrow the energy of the players. Um, a lot of that storytelling and a lot of that creativity is coming from them. And if I ask them a bunch of questions, they will give me answers that I have never thought of before, <laughs> that would never have occurred to me that that's the solution to this problem. And it's fascinating and it's interesting and they get to do what they wanna do. And then at the end of it, they still arrive where I need them to arrive, um, even though they feel like they've done it their way and with their own drive and their own agency. Wouldn't it be nice to gamify your Dungeon Master abilities? In D&D, characters can reach level 20, so why can't Dungeon Masters? We're happy to tell you that now you can. We created the Dungeon Master Level Up Guide for you. It's a simple tool to gamify your progression to higher and higher levels of Dungeon Mastery. It includes Dungeon Master levels 1 to 20 with associated XP requirements, as well as a long list of Dungeon Master activities that will give you XP to get you to level 20. Each activity has a challenge rating and an XP amount. In order to level up, all you need to do is find out how much XP you currently have, find out how much you need, and then pick activities to get you there you can get the Dungeon Master Level Up Guide for free by going to sessionzerostudios.com slash newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter once you get there and we'll email you the Level Up Guide in the first email. Finally, leveling up as a DM can be as fun as leveling up a character. As a listener of this show, you obviously love story. Now that you've had a chance to craft your own story by listening to this show, wouldn't it be nice to get some inspiration? Or maybe you just want a moment of immersion and escape and entertainment. 
Whatever it is, come join us on our new show, Pact and Boom. It's an actual play D&D podcast in the world of Calignos, where our characters, Jolly, Wolfgang, and Alan, will find and meet each other in hell. And from there, start a troublemaking journey with some near-death experiences that will hopefully lead them to a happy ending. Find it wherever great podcasts are heard or just go to sessionzerostudios.com slash pact and boom. That's P-A-C-T-N-B-O-O-N. Start listening today. I... I really like that because I feel like uh, the way I've always thought about not railroading players before is kind of being more open as in like oh you just don't yeah you can sign posts like oh hey maybe go over here or go over here but otherwise you're not doing a lot of presenting to them and kind of just letting them do their own thing but you're saying like no present to them but give them a question rather than a statement being like hey what do you want to do? So that way they have to deal with the key conflict, but like, do they have to choose one way? No, they have both multiple ways, but they're dealing with that conflict. They're not mm-hmm. going and beating up some random baker down the street. They're like, no, we're, we're going to have you actually, <laughs> I'm going to push this in front of you and then you have choices. Yeah. yeah. And the, uh, you know, the, the game system that you're using is going to guide how much of how much actual guidance they require. Yeah. Something like Blades in the Dark, which is one of my very favorite games to run. Such a good one. Um, there's, there aren't any signposts, because they can go wherever they want to go. The, the system is built around the idea that there is no preconceived story. And so they can just make it up as they go, and you just roll with it, and it works. Whereas if you're doing something like D&D, um, one of my favorite, I, I think the best D&D campaign is actually the one that comes in the Essentials kit. Yeah. Um, uh, where you're just trying to find this white dragon and you start in this little village and it presents you with like four or five um, little, or maybe you just start with three, but they're like jobs posted on a board in town. And the players can, and this is so brutally simple. The players can choose which of the jobs they want to do. And they go out and they do it, and then they come back to the town, and now there's, you know, you've replaced the one they did with one or two more. And so they always have a choice of what they're going to do next, but the jobs that they are choosing are pointing them in a direction. And if at some point they say, well, we don't actually want to do any of these jobs, we want to you know, kill the baker and take over the bakery. Like, yes, I guess that's possible, but unless you are also, as a player, excited about that, then it's an opportunity to say, well, that's not really the type of campaign that I had in mind. (laughs) And if they say, well, we are sick of goblin hunting and we want to run a bread baking campaign, you know, having that open communication with the players and saying, well, what at, what kind of story are we actually trying to tell? You've seen tantalizing hints about this big white dragon on this mountain that, that you know, is clearly what this campaign is intended to be about. If that doesn't interest you, then do we need to start a different campaign? Um, or do we need to refocus? Um, and that's an extreme case where you need to, you know, have this kind of come to Jesus meeting with your players and say, well, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing at all. And I know that a lot of GMs are incredibly leery and reticent to get into those kind of structural questions with your players. We have this sense of, I'm in charge, mm-hmm. and everything that I say is true, and there is no man behind the curtain, <laughs> and you just... <laughs> You know, everything that you say, I can roll with it. Yes, and let's go. Uh, And it doesn't have to be that way. You can be very upfront and say, well, actually, um, you know, you as players are veering in a direction I had not planned for. Is that what you're doing on purpose? Is, would you like me to retool the campaign to handle this new direction you're going into? Or are you interested in hunting down that white dragon? Um, and and 
having those kinds of conversations, I think, can be really healthy. It is okay to acknowledge that you're playing a game. Yeah. It's okay to acknowledge as a group that you're telling a story together and deciding where you want that story to go. It doesn't have to be pure improv 100% of the time. I, I think part of this goes back to a little bit of the role of the DM, you know, um, because if they've agreed to have you as the DM, then they have in some way, shape, or form acknowledged that, yes, we would like you to start helping us tell a story, right? Like, they put you in this um, superior role in the sense of you have a lot more responsibility than us. But also I think it's interesting because D&D, well, every RPG, right, uh, everyone at the table is both audience and performers at the same time. And so I think that goes to exactly your point. Um, there's nothing wrong with realizing that you are part of the audience and you get to have a vote in what you watch, right? Yeah. Um, one of our past guests, Jay Foster, he says he, he follows up with his players every two weeks, right? How are we doing? You know, what, is your, what does your character want to do? How are you liking what you're playing? And I think that's such a sublime way to do it. But also, to your point, you can absolutely pay attention to what the people are doing, right? So, you know, in one of my previous campaigns, I saw that my wife... Uh, she was playing a rogue type character. She was trying to do all these kind of very rogue things. So uh, we were playing Prince of the Apocalypse. What did I do? I dangled a, 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 some bait in front of her. I let her find a dead body in a dungeon with this black bow that she picked it up and it started talking to her. Fast forward, she's accidentally summoned the big bad, right? And that's the new big bad of the campaign. Because I, I keyed off of what they were interested in and, you know, they overpowered the, the Princess of the Apocalypse pretty quickly, and we moved on to a whole different campaign, right? Because yeah. that was boring, you know? You know, and that is such an important thing to do. Um, and, and that's one of the very first things. That's why we recommend having a Session Zero, right? Is figure yeah. out what power fantasy is each player going for. Um, I was in a campaign years ago, uh, an Eberron campaign, and uh, there was a rogue who wanted to spend his entire time hiding in the shadows and then leaping out and assassinating someone and then jumping back into the shadows again. Which is kind of how the rogue archetype can yeah. be built, right? Yeah. That's how Sneak Attack is designed to work in 5th edition. This was way back in 3rd. Um, but the Game Master put us in uh, the, the entire like final five levels of the campaign was all spent in a part of the world where it was all giants and constructs. And constructs cannot, like, yeah. they, they're immune to sneak attack damage, uh, and the giants, I think, were somehow also immune to it or something like that. Um, and it was the story the Game Master wanted to tell, but it this poor player couldn't indulge the power fantasy that he was interested in. And if you figure out well, what is that player trying to get out of this? How do they want to see the, to see themselves? Um, oh, I remember the problem with the giants is that they all had huge uh, damage reduction, which was a thing in third edition. And I was a ranger that was just multi-attack. I had something like 18 attacks per melee round, <laughs> and they all did very little damage, but they stacked up. Mm -hmm. But against damage reduction, I would basically go up and slap a guy 50 times and then he'd be totally fine and so yeah um and and it's again okay to talk to your players directly someone's playing a paladin say well what kind of paladin what do you want to see what kind of heroic things do you want to be doing if they want to you know stand there and turn aside undead to save cowering villagers behind them and then you never give them undead to turn or cowering mm. villagers to save, yeah. you're not doing your job. And it's okay to ask what those power fantasies are so that you can fulfill them. Yeah, and I think, I mean, as much as a GM kind of accepts that extra burden of like, hey, you have to do everything now uh, in order to tell a story, it's like, listen, if you want to tell a story, you could just write a book, right? If that was all you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. it gives you full control. But the great thing about any RPG is you get to collaborate. So, like, the more you lean into that, the more you're actually, like, 
getting the most out of the medium. And and so like I love the fact that you can just like the idea of being vulnerable and being like, "Hey, this is very different from what I planned. Not not bad, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Can we, you know, let's let's have a little powwow, make sure we're uh, in the same place. And then if you do that, then like in many ways the players will be a lot happier with you because mm -hmm. they're they'll be able to see what's happening and yeah. then you'll slowly move away and they'll get more immersed and they'll kind of forget about the man behind the curtain for a bit but in that immediate moment you got a nice redirection that that's going to play out a lot better throughout the rest of the campaign well, and and this is a skill that i learned from writing which is you know i've got my outline i outline extensively and then i start writing and the characters are doing something i didn't plan for and so the the answer is not, oh, stick to the outline. And the answer is not, oh, let's follow the characters. The answer is, take a moment and decide which is better. To take a look at both options and go, well, <laughs> is my outline flawed? And, and subconsciously I knew that, and that's why these characters are veering somewhere else. Or is my outline right, and I need to you know, just not let myself fly off into flights of fancy and, and let these characters do whatever they want. And when you're gaming, it's the great thing is that there's actual people <laughs> behind those characters and you can just ask them uh, and say, well, and maybe the answer is, give me a week, let's not meet next week so that I have time to come up with enough stuff to follow this new path you've decided to take. Or maybe the answer is, yeah, sorry, Game Master, we just got caught up in the moment. We really are <laughs> interested in hunting that dragon. Let's go back to that. Um, maybe the answer is, let's stick to this campaign for now, but the next campaign is all going to be about owning a bakery. Like, whatever it is, you can answer those <laughs> questions together. And yeah. it's worth pointing out that, uh, like you were saying, uh, the GM is also a player in the game. Their fun is just as important as everyone else's fun. You need to make sure that you are all enjoying yourselves. Uh, neither side of the table needs to be in thrall to the other one. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just writing down your, your running a bakery campaign idea. <laughs> Actually, that sounds that sounds super, super fun. Doesn't it sound really good? Suddenly the white ja dragon isn't a dragon. He's just really, like, it's that's the newspaper. The giant. And he's jumping in to oh, review I your bakery. That. The white the, dragon the newspaper. The Pillsbury dough dragon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan, it has been just so fun having you here. And, listener, I did not get to, like, half of the question, any of the questions that I wrote down before the show. Oh, shoot. And are not we even, out of time? We are actually uh, coming up <laughs> with it. But, but that's always a good sign because that means, you know, time flew. We had fun. Um, but listener, if you want us to ask Dan more questions about making characters, how to do relationships, like how to make those seem real, um, and how to learn all the rules of any RPG, because it sounds like you know basically all of them, um, you should reach out to Dan on his social media and tell him thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on our show. But before we do let you go, we have two questions for you. Okay. Uh, and you can take these in any order. Uh, and also, if you want, you can have Tanner and I kind of do some of it as well so you can have some time to think. But first question, as a parting gift to our listener, what is the last piece of juicy information you a want them juicy to... Juicy yeah. GMing advice. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm going to... Uh, take a run from something you just mentioned um, I do play a lot of different systems I, I counted through my PDF library the other day and it is well over a hundred different role playing games D&D um, &D is huge D&D 5th edition is a phenomenon like we've never seen before it is larger than every other role playing game on the market combined that's not an exaggeration uh, and there's good reasons for that it's a good system that I enjoy but if I have to give one piece of juicy GM advice, it is step out of that comfort zone even just once and try a different game system. Because um, the, there are things that D&D is good at and there are things that it's not very good at. Um, and if you want to try something else, uh, what I love is a game system that really nails the... Uh, the tone of what it's trying to do. Um, something like Blades in the Dark, where the mechanics are incentivizing specific behaviors and styles 
that lend themselves perfectly to being criminals in a fantasy industrial city. Um, whereas, you know, the mechanics of Pendragon are deeply Arthurian and embedded in that sense of chivalry and being knights and this long form storytelling. The Great Pendragon campaign is 80 years long. Um, and there's so many that we haven't even talked about tonight. Uh, Star Trek Adventures is one of my favorites. It's a top three, top three RPG for me. It absolutely, because of the way it handles problem solving, it captures that sense of Star Trek trying to use science to work together to solve a problem in a way that something like D&D doesn't. Uh, because that's not what D&D is trying to do. So, uh, branch out. It, it'll take some convincing <laughs> to get your players to go along with you. Uh, but whether you are a player or a GM, uh, try something new. You don't have to try it forever. You can just do, run a one-shot some night. Uh, but try some of these other systems because there's a lot out there and they are brilliant and wonderful and you'll have a lot of fun with them. I love it. If I could add on to that, uh, like you mentioned, Dan, earlier, like find out what kind of campaign your players are looking for and as much as you can fit that within the boundaries of D&D, sometimes there's a campaign that's like, oh, you want to be a sneaky rogue? That campaign exists. And like you mentioned, there's specific uh, actual mechanics for it. And, or like, oh, you're doing kind of like a governmental organization, like looking at mysteries kind of thing. You could do that within D&D. Or you do something like, I don't know, Delta Green or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, and also, we've talked a lot on our podcast about kind of giving the players ownership mm -hmm. of, you know, of the gameplay, of the story uh, in their own ways. What better way than to be like, hey, I want to try out a new, like, game system. Let's actually study this, meet up in a couple weeks, do character building, and then week after that, we start playing. That's a great way to let them know that, like, hey, you're not just kind of sitting back and letting me do all the work. We're all collaborating. We're all doing, like, we all know the mechanics. We can learn them. And we can also tell a great story, regardless of the system, right? Yeah. And uh, I second that 100%. And actually, I do have a recommendation. If you're looking for an RPG system to try out, why not try out the Cosmere RPG system, which yeah. we <laughs> didn't even have a chance to talk about. I feel super bad. So yeah, before, we should talk about that. Yeah, before we do uh, go, uh, Dan works with Dragonsteel, right? You yes, are... I'm the vice president of narrative at Dragonsteel Entertainment, which is Brandon Sanderson's company. Also, that title's so cool. Um, but Tanner, I mean, I would have gone with like Viceroy yeah, of narrative, yeah, yeah. Right? or like High King. I had to fit within their system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't Dang be the it. Sultan of narrative. <laughs> but you can always buy whatever the platform Sultan you want, right? Swat. So if it's there, it's it's real. But Tanner, I feel super bad. So you did have a question about the Cosmere RPG, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so it was a different question. I'm going to ask you one based on our conversation. So you've talked a lot about. Uh, about kind of curving the story, uh, and you, you're really good with story, specifically. Uh, I've, I've heard that the Cosmere RPG has specific mechanics that really help with narrative. Mm -hmm. um, were you involved in that? I was. Uh, I've been involved at every stage of that. I am not uh, a designer on the game. Yeah. Um, I uh, got to help direct a lot of the early uh, kind of ideation of what mm -hmm. kind of game do we want this to be. I did, I, I was initially raring for a very abstract narrative system. <laughs> and uh, they eventually talked me out of that. And I think that they were right to make that call. One of the interesting things about uh, Brandon Sanderson novels is that he is a power gamer. And on some yes. level, all of his characters are power gamers. You can see this with Vin in Mistborn and Kaladin in, in uh, Stormlight Archive and any character you care to mention, if they use the magic, then ultimately under the hood what that character is doing is trying to find loopholes in how the magic works so that they can beat the bad guy by breaking the system. <laughs> and so we needed to have a system that would be crunchy enough to allow players that same opportunity. It is yeah. not a super crunchy system. It's not Pathfinder Second, um, but it is. It's got enough crunch to it that you can that you can do that. Um, at the same time, there's things like swearing oaths, and one of the things that I was adamant about 
uh, and it was not a difficult argument to win because they all agreed, is that um, swearing an oath needed to be something that happened during play rather than in, you know, off screen in between sessions. We didn't want it to be like, uh, you know, you win a boss fight and then you're like, yay, thanks for coming to this session. Everybody level up and uh, you swore the third ideal, so oh, yes. now you get access to flight or whatever it is. Because um, that would be boring. That would be the very mechanical kind of grocery list way of doing something. Whereas in the books, somebody will swear an ideal in the middle of a battle mm. and then they just level up right there and all of a sudden they have new powers. And so uh, we were able to incorporate that really narrative element mechanically into the game so that you can feel like you are in the books swearing an ideal in order to beat a bad guy rather than just downtime between sessions. Yeah. Wow, that's that. so cool. <laughs> yeah. I just got to say. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's so true because like, how many times do people get a level up, like in D&D or any other system? And then you're like, oh man, we kind of have to explain that. And then you're like, okay, how did your character get stronger? And like, that only sometimes happens. Most mm -hmm. of the time it's like, okay, just be ready next time with your next level. And it's like, why not make that a really cool moment? You know? Mm -hmm. I love exactly. that. Exactly. Let it, let it be something awesome um, that changes the story in some meaningful way rather than just you've got some extra powers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, final thing I want to say about the uh, Cosmere RPG is I was the, the main story guy behind the Stonewalkers campaign, Oof. which is the big five level campaign that is uh, launching as part of the Kickstarter. Um, it's really cool. Um, we are telling um, some awesome stories behind the scenes. And every time I went to Brandon and said, hey, is this a toy I'm allowed to play with? He would say, yes, and also this one. <laughs> and so uh, that campaign is going to answer a lot of questions that uh, people have been asking him for years. Uh, like, how did this thing get to be in this place in this guy's possession and he's just never had a chance to put it into the books anywhere we answer it in the Stonewalkers campaign so it's it's gonna be awesome so stoked and, and that one covers like a period of time right um it's it's uh kind of concurrent with words of radiance oh that's great yeah cause that's the one which is the second book, that's mm -hmm. where the Everstorm shows up. And yes. so we you get a play through that transition. Oh, you get a play through? Oh, yeah. that's really good, guys. Spoiler alert, guys. Really, after the fact, but whatever. I mean, it's not really a spoiler because yeah, it's been out for if you know the timing of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in so, fact, I'm probably being a lot closer with spoilers that I. There's things I think are already revealed and I'm just not saying them <laughs> yeah. because I'm not sure. Just to be safe. <laughs> so honestly, I mean. Uh, so the Kickstarter is still going on right now. If you have, if you haven't looked at it, where have you been? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, go. It's the Cosmere RPG. It's on Kickstarter. Amazing. Take a yeah, look at it. Yeah. By the time this airs, it will have closed. Um, but the backer kit is going to be out. Perfect. To, you know, to fulfill it, and I think that there will still be some opportunity at that point to Great. jump in, or at least get your friend who backed it to order some extra books for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess final piece of advice, have a rich friend, guys. It's always <laughs> a good one. Always a good advice. Or an interested friend. Exactly. Also, uh, just here before we, we end, uh, Dan, thank you so much for being here. Hey. Honestly. Thanks for having me here. It means the world. Also, really fun, you know, we, like we've said, for years we've heard you talk about writing. Yeah. It's nice hearing you talk about, you know, DMing, yeah. your other passion, yeah. right? Just <laughs> as insightful, I have to say. So if you ever do a third podcast, I hope you don't do one in our line of work. <laughs> then we'll be the then we're screwed. Exactly, exactly. Oh, boy, that would be fun. But I don't have time. So <laughs> yes. thank you for covering that for me. No problem. Um, and we'd also like to thank Andrew. He's uh, Andrew Ashby. He's he's kind of hosting this. We're at We Geek together right mm -hmm. now, and he just this amazing setup for anyone that's watching. Yes. If you're listening, we're in a cool setup. Believe us. Uh, but <laughs> but we're so grateful that he provided this place and just like the the recording equipment. 
And yeah, uh, anything else, Justin? Yeah, I would just say We Geek Together does have an online store. They are a local game store, but you can buy things from them if you want. Just go to wegeektogether.com. And if you're in the area, so in Utah, you can at some point, hopefully soon, rent this amazing space for some undetermined price. You'll have to talk to Andrew about that, but uh, it is well <laughs> worth it, I have to say. And uh, thank you so much, Andy, for sure. Um, Dan, before we let you go, yes. how can people reach out to you, support you, stalk you? Hopefully not, but see what you're up to. I am almost entirely off of social media these days. Yeah. Um, if you, but the thing to remember is the Dan Wells, the Dan Wells. Uh, that uh, is um, my website, mm -hmm. and that is the main way to get the, to to reach me. Uh, there's a contact link on there. Also, you can sign up for my newsletter, which goes out usually once a month, but sometimes we forget. Um, I do have an Instagram, uh, which is Danwell's Author. Um, my wife runs that. I don't do. I don't know how Instagram works. So if you have a question and you ask it on there, it she might ask it she might ask me to answer it um <laughs> but yeah i am i am mostly alone but the dan wells <laughs> is my website and that is the easiest way to find me and see what's going on excellent well listener you will have all those links always in the show notes this has been another amazing episode uh if i can say so myself from Absolutely. how to be a better dm uh Tanner, anything else you want to part with i i mean guys life is wonderful <sighs> That, that's it. No, sorry, we covered a lot of stuff today. We did. We did. It was a great episode. And we'll be back next time with another handcrafted episode just for you. But until then, my friends, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Brought to you by Session Zero Studios. For more information, visit sessionzerostudios.com.